Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, April 27, 2017, and this is the Week in Charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. I am humbled by your presence, so thank you for that. So, what are we going to talk about? Boy, do we have a plethora of stuff to talk about. New bull leg in the works, or is it the end of the world? Well, let's scratch out into the world for now, since the market is making new highs, and I have a lot more to say about that. If you have any questions, let me know. Your favorite stock picks? Hold off until we get to the live charts, if you don't mind. And once we do, and this is for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time and then hit return. And that way I'll know whether I covered your stock or not. I want to follow up on IPOs based on an email I received. And I want to get these two rules out there, the first two rules of trading the IPOs. And, and I think that's going to help you uh, tremendously, even if you don't have the course. Of course, I'd love you for you to buy the course. I want to continue to follow up on trading and methodology. I'm going to keep doing that until everything stops out of that portfolio going back to middle of uh, February. And that'll make more sense in a minute for those of you who are new to the show. This week's focus, I want to get back to why trend following is hard. And this is based on a video that I watched with Greg Morris yesterday. And one of the reasons that it's hard, in addition to some other reasons that we're going to explore here in just a few minutes, is that most of the time you will be in a drawdown. Now, I know I've talked about this quite a bit before, but I've got some good examples and some good things to follow up on. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. And if you're really bored, you can go to my website and, uh, and read it. But I could sum it up quickly by saying all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff could happen between now and then. All right, let's continue this follow-up on Snap Crap. And as you know, and as you'll see in one second too, when it comes to IPOs, you really don't want to rush out and buy them before they go public. And then after they go public, you certainly want to wait for them to establish themselves. And I'll show you the rule that for just one sec in just one second. In fact, the rule is actually this. Let me just get... Excuse me, let me just get a little bit ahead of myself. The rule is to wait five days at least. And Will Rogers once said, buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them. And I agree. And he was being a little facetious, but when it comes to IPOs, there's a lot of truth in that. And the fact that you have such a limited trading history you could actually just wait to see if they go up. And then rule number one, which we'll come to in just one second, again, is to wait five days with a few little caveats in there. Now, a few weeks back, it's, of course, time's going so fast this year. It might have been a month back. I said that along those lines, what would happen if you waited for an IPO to do two things? And inadvertently, uh, I kind of backed into a system. And somehow, somehow, Excuse me. Let me back that up a little bit. Sometimes that's how I come up with new discoveries is just say, okay, well, how do I design a system to prove my point? And then sometimes that becomes an actual setup in and of itself. And the thing I was thinking was, okay, if we had a five-day average, five-day moving average, that would keep you from trading IPOs until day six, and that's fine. And then also the low would have to be greater than the moving average. And then one other rule, the close would have to be a new closing high. And if the high of the IPO was set on the first day, it would also have to be above that high of the first day. Now, I've talked about this quite a bit. So if that doesn't make sense to you, just go in and watch those videos. Uh, the week of charts going back several weeks, uh, maybe even a month now or so, whenever this thing came public. So the bottom line is, if they don't go up, don't buy them. So rule number one, again, is let themselves establish themselves for at least five days before looking to trade. The caveat here is that I do have a pattern that could have you long by the end of five days. So wait at least 
nine days before looking to trade them. And as a general rule, you want to give them about a week to establish themselves. Now, the other thing I was saying earlier is that if the high is set on the first day of trading, so let's say an IPO comes public and it does this, then if you're going to trade that IPO, it has to close above that high, okay? So the moving average pattern is more like, like this. Let's just say it establishes itself over a few days. And let's say that uh, your new closing high is this for the first five days or until you get that moving average coming in. So in order to buy, it would have to be above the moving average and close above the closing high, okay? But if the new high was set on day one, it would also have to close above the day one high. Now, the reason I came up with this rule is because a lot of times when they come public with an IPO, if they price too high, they will die. So if they price them and then it makes that high on the first day of trading and it immediately begins to implode, then something's wrong with the IPO. So you want to wait until the market can prove itself even further by not only making a new high, but also making a new closing high above that prior high, okay? Now, one other thing is that if the high is set in the first day of trading, then again, you wanna wait for that high to get taken out. And that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble with IPOs. You're welcome. Now, the only caveat here is let's say this IPO bottoms out. And I was trying to think of an exact number today because everybody always asks me, well, Dave, exactly how many days? I don't know. Okay. But six months is a number that comes to mind. So let's say this IPO goes six months. And now it's not so much an IPO. It's more what I call a toddler. Okay. And this could even be a year or more. And it just kind of implodes and goes down for a long, long time. But then it bottoms out, and then you get a bow tie or something over here, some sort of transitional pattern. That's okay, okay? That's kind of a Phoenix IPO style. I think, a, oh, what do I call it? Baby come back, okay? Or something like that. So it's okay for this uh, IPO to this toddler. Maybe that's why I call it baby come back. It's okay for this toddler type of stock to make a, a, a bow tie over here. Now, it's not as lucrative uh, as trading that initial IPO, but sometimes you can get some pretty substantial moves here, and sometimes it'll actually go on to make new highs. So it can be a good trade, obviously. But usually the euphoria early on can really help you out in IPOs. But sometimes uh, the underwriter goofs, okay? Sometimes the company shouldn't have come public as early as it did. They didn't get their act together. And whatever the case may be, they get their act together or whatever happens. And then all of a sudden, they begin to rally. Also, there's other things too, and you don't want to think too much, but there's other things too that might happen, like some of the supply might work its way through the system. Because you got to realize back here, and I don't want to go, I don't want to give you the whole IPO course. Not that I don't want to give you anything, but it's like it's just too much, not enough time for to teach the whole course. But you got people back here pre-IPO that are looking to get out of break even. So a lot of the selling will work its way through the system. All these peoples, all these peeps will be likely washed out of the system. So that helps in the process too. But again, just to, without without going through the entire course, sometimes after a long basing action you could get a nice transitional pattern. You don't have to worry as much about that one-day high. Now, that one-day high is still significant, though, okay? So when you do see one come up and make new highs, even if it's a year from now or even two years from now, Ferrari comes to mind, for instance, it still can make a significant move above that high once it happens. And once it starts making new highs, obviously everyone is happy. So never forget that everything I do has a psychological backing to it. Now, the second rule is if the high, let's, I'm sorry, I already said that. Uh, and the point I wanted to make is once an IPO establishes itself, say six months or longer, then the transitional patterns can be used, okay? So you want to wait until at least a five-day closing high and if the IPO sets the high on the first day of trading, okay, so that's a high, one, two, three, four, five. 
it not only has to close at a new high, but it has to close above that high. Okay. So hopefully that made sense. I kind of I I wasn't paying attention and then I put rule one and rule two together. But the, the rules are let them establish yourself for at least five days. And again, there are cases where you can get in on the close of the fifth day. So let's just say 4.99 days. And then if it sets the high on the first day of trading, it also has to close at not just a new closing high, but a new high relative to that first day's close, a new, a new high period, okay? Okay, I got an email this morning right before I was ready to, um, I'm sorry, this email came in last night. I got another email we'll talk about later. Hi, Dave. I've been watching the new issue, Goose. It died on first week of trading, but then sideways for about a month, and now looks like it's moving towards its first week closing high. And last two days has moved significantly, about five days EMA, five EMA. Any thoughts? Thanks, Jared. Okay, now that's the reason why I wanted to cover those two IPO rules, because notice in this particular case that this stock made its high on the first day of trading, okay? Now, if that's confusing to you, just look, just say, okay, what's the, what's the first rule? One, two, three, four. Five. Okay, what's the highest day for those five days of trading? Day one. So since the high was set on day one, we're going to have to exceed this high based on rule number one before we think about trading this IPO. Now, I hear what Jerry's saying because if you look right here, it doesn't have to go that far to close at a new closing high, okay? A new closing high would be here, a new high close, a new high and close, what's the, what's the proper way to say that? A new high, a close above the first day high. Let's just say that, okay? So it would actually have to be somewhere up here for me to consider this IPO early in the process. Now, if this thing goes down to bottoms for months and months and months and months, and again, I don't have the exact number, but let's just say six months, then maybe a bow tie or first thrust might work. Robert says all-time high. Yeah, so if it closes at an all-time high, okay, which this would be your reference for that, anything above this line here, then you can start to begin to consider it as a new candidate. No, it's not a new closing high because a new closing high, a new closing high would be here. An all-time high would be, a new closing high would be here because this is the highest close that this stock has closed at, okay? So it would be a new high would have to close at a new high. I guess that's the easiest way of saying it. Close at a new high. Okay. All-time high, yeah. So notice here, again, the high was set on the first day of trading. Now, I want to continue my discussion. It's so funny. Everything makes so much sense before it gets started. And then uh, once I start talking, it's like, did I say that right? I want to continue to follow up on following a methodology. And this could have failed miserably, but so far, knock on wood, it's worked out pretty well. But if you go back to February 7th, the portfolio was on the cusp of going negative. And my point was, hey, you know what? Stay tuned. It ain't over until it's over. One big winner pays for them all, as Ed Sakota sang in the Whipsaw song. So if we go back to February 7th, you can see, again, the portfolio was barely above water. And if you take out the swing trade, half of the first one in here, NTB, of 1000 bucks would actually be underwater. And my point then was just sit tight and let's see how it all shakes out. Now, the only thing we have left in the portfolio, FYI, are the ones that are in yellow. Everything else has been stopped out or closed out, however you want to look at it. But you can see by following along, you have roughly a $4,000 gain versus a measly $500 gain. 
I can't guarantee you that it'll always work this great. But this does, or has, I should say, turned into a great example of just following the plan. Now, as I said earlier, it's the hardest, easiest thing you ever, you'll ever do because there was really not much to do. And if you go in and watch pre previous videos, I'll show setups that worked out really great. But 90% of the time, there was nothing to do but just leave it in your portfolio, okay? You can leave it completely untouched. Maybe put your trailing stop order in, but that's about it. And once that trailing stop gets so far away, you could actually end up putting a, a good to cancel order. I usually don't recommend that, but if the stop's a long ways away, sometimes that's okay. So once again, with, we get to say bye, Felicia. Now, I want to get back to more on why trend following is so hard. I just showed you and talked about a lot of the time we've just been waiting. And we're not built to be patient, at least not in this day and age where everything is instant. Instant grits, uh, microwave society, so to speak, as I often say. The video stores no longer exist because nobody wants to drive to a video store. The last one closed down recently around here. I figured they were selling crack or something. I couldn't figure out how they were staying open. Now, yesterday I was watching a video on YouTube from Greg Morris, and I liked it this morning. So if you go to my YouTube channel, which is YouTube slash DaveLandry.com, you spell the D-O-T out. And if you're on YouTube, just look for my channel. And I would appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. Um, that just gives you the videos first. But if you go there, you can see I liked it yesterday. Uh, Greg was talking again in, I guess, some sort of economic conference. And one thing he pointed out was that the market makes new highs 4% of the time, only 4% of the time. And I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. And the original research, or the research, I should say, you could also find it if you're interested in more details. I'm sure it's in Investing with the Trend, uh, his book that he wrote a few years ago, which is a good book, and I'd suggest you read it. A little bit more uh, cerebral and deeper than I thought it would be, but there's a lot of good stuff buried in there, things like this, that when you flesh them out a little bit, there's a lot more to it and a lot more implications. In fact, I want to take that line of reasoning and apply it to an individual trade. So what if I told you that you were up nearly 70% on a trade since mid-January? How would you feel about that? Well, you should feel pretty good, right? Well, here's the interesting thing. Along the lines of what Greg was saying about an overall market only being at new highs, 4% of the time, I thought I would go in and look at this trade from its inception, and it triggered back here, right here, the day before this day, actually. And I thought it was kind of cool. So the first day of the trade, you'd be underwater. Everything red is backing and filling, and everything green is a new closing high. Now, if you just kind of eyeball this, you can see that there's a lot more red in here than green. In fact, 80% of the time, round numbers, the stock is backing and filling. In other words, you're not making new closing highs. Now, the significance of that is 80% of the time, you're giving up money on the trade. Okay, now this is the biggest cherry-picked winner in our portfolio. So I, I thought I would take the best and look at it. And again, you're up nearly 70% since mid-January. So not a bad trade so far, knock on wood. Okay, so I just found this fascinating when you put this in. So all I did was I, I programmed a little indicator and TC and it didn't really it didn't really stand out that much so I went ahead and filled it in 
And all I was saying is it's it's either 100% or zero. So if it's a new closing high, then I want to show plot up here and then plot zero if it's not, okay? And that's why the graph looks like it does. It's a yes, no, Boolean type of thing. So I find this fascinating that even though this is a fantastic trade, I'd love to have a dozen more of these in my portfolio. 80% of the time, you're giving up money on this trade. And it'll be interesting to see if some of the losers in the portfolio turn into winners. And then this is gonna this could end up being closer to that 90 something percent average like the overall market. So I just thought that was pretty cool. Now, what's interesting is the more you learn about how markets actually work, the easier it becomes for you to wrap your head around the trading psychology and why that trend following in is so hard. Now, there's three parts of trading psychology, and I guess the third part could be parts of, of one and two, but there's a physiological, physiological part, and I often talk about the amygdala and the emotional part of your brain and how those snap decisions that you make are great for keeping you from being run over or if you burn your hand or whatever from hurting yourself further on a hot stove but not so good in trading because it makes you too emotional now all trades will have emotions and I'm going to reiterate that fact in just one second but the physiological aspects of us can deter our trading and I wrote an article a while back called wind the clock I got a little aviation clock on my desk and I now wind the clock right before hit enter on any trade. And that gives me a few seconds to bypass that amygdala and get to everything else that's sloshing around up there. So here's your brain and there's your amygdala and that's probably drawn somewhat to scale. And this makes really quick decisions which are great. Fly to fight, jump out of the way of that cab coming at you, etc. But when you go to trade, you need to bypass that and get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there to avoid making an emotionally charged decision, okay? All decisions have to go through your amygdala, but if you give it a few seconds, you kind of train your brain or trick your brain, so to speak, to get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. So there are some physiological things and you have to wrap your head around those and embrace and accept them to understand trading psychology and then realize, well, wait a minute, it's not me, it's everyone. It's hard for everyone. And then obviously there are some psychological things that I often talk about. Psychological, does spell it right? Yes. Well, it looks like I left out some letters. But anyway, you get the idea. So there's some psychological problems too. The real world, the trading world, two different worlds. You have to take action in the real world or you're going to get fired or your company is going to go down to tubes. But in the trading world, a lot of times there's nothing to do. And that's fodder for many presentations. In fact, I've talked about that many times before. Now, what Greg got me thinking about is that there are statistical anomalies of the markets that can cause psychological issues. So if you think about it, the fact that only 4% of the time the market is making new highs, it's 96% of the time you're waiting and thinking, and, and that thinking will kill you if you're trying to make too many predictions during that time as opposed to following along with the longer term trend. That Thinking will kill you if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, this position is not making new highs. Maybe I should bail out, okay? And it seems like, as Murphy would have it, the day after you make the decision, that position makes a quantum leap higher. So in addition to the physiological and the psychology, psychological, it's hard for me to read the word because it's spelled wrong, uh, psychological issues, there are some statistical anomalies 
that kind of play upon these first two. So the point I'm trying to make is even when you're right, you're wrong most of the time. So I left this slide in from last week. So you have to be accepting of what the market is giving. And as I said last week when I was talking about the traits of successful traders is that you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Those of you with children, especially young children, even older children, right? <laughs> Sometimes you have to tell them that. Well, same thing applies to trading. Now, as I alluded to a minute ago, and I've talked about this quite a bit, with every decision comes emotions and stress, okay? Even what you're going to have for lunch. We're emotional beings. We're emotional creatures. Get over it. If you have that part of your brain damaged where you can no longer make decisions, I'm sorry, where you no longer have emotions, where you're kind of an emotionless person, then you can no longer make decisions because there's no consequence, there's no stress or emotions involved with that. So, as I said before, let's say you decide to get in a stock at 740. The reason I have 740 is because I took this from a setup I had. I forget which setup it was. It was a setup on my trading service. And if you don't take the trade, now you're faced with three decisions. And which each one of the decisions becomes emotions, emotions and stress. So do you get it even though the price is higher? Do you give it even though the price is lower? It's a bargain, right? Or do you not do anything? Now, along those lines, I got an email right before I started my presentation. And he said, should I? I missed the fuel yesterday. That's a setup. Should I wait for an intraday pullback to attempt to catch it? as it resumes, should I jump, just jump on with a market order or should do, or do I go with a buy stop above the current, and I'm, I'm assuming high on this one. And then he went on to say, this is the only recommendation I've missed in joining your service, Jim. So as you can see, Jim has come up with three possible scenarios out of one decision. So there was one decision to be made and now he has three and he actually left out one which he's asking me on don't do anything. Okay. So his life became more complicated. So if you take the original decision and just follow the plan then you avoid making all these other decisions. And this begins to grow, as you can see, geometrically. So the way you solve for this is just follow the original plan, and that's going to help you to reduce tremendously the amount of stress and decisions that you're having to make, or I should say the amount of decisions you're having to make and the associated emotions and stress that goes with them. As I often say, we're only wired for so many decisions. We're only wired for so many emotional round trips. ER doctors and <laughs> Phil, you being silly. ER doctors and air traffic controllers have a high burnout rate, especially air, air traffic controller, because of the amount of decisions they have to make under stress. And I don't kind of beat a dead horse here. Imagine that. Me do that. I got to get out some more, but uh, last October I was speaking to a group of predominantly day traders. Not one of the guys that I could tell, that I remember at least, was over 30 years old. They were all young, and as I said last week or week before, young and full of piss and vinegar. And that's great, but how long can you keep that up? And I think at one point I told them doing a Q&A, if you're making money, don't let me F you up, but... At some point, start making that turn so you're not sitting there grinding it out all day going through these emotional round trips. Now, it's much easier said than done, and I'm the first to admit that, okay? Trust me, I F up. I drop F bombs. I think that's probably why, not to be vain. I mean, I'm doing just the opposite, I actually. But I think that's why my 
psychology lessons are becoming better and better and better because I lived through this own psychology, this, this, these psychological problems, and everyone does, okay? As I've said before, my friends who have public funds or managing billions of dollars of public funds and you see them go through a pretty bad drawdown, I don't call them up and say, hey, buddy, does that suck? Because I know it sucks, okay? So feel normal if you're having problems. Feel normal if you're making mistakes. But what I would encourage you to do is don't beat yourself up as long as you're moving in the right directions. Direction, I should say. Now, one other negative about not following a plan is that you could end up in a state of regret. And one of those states of regret could be that if you miss an outlier, and that's one of the downsides of trade trading. As I said earlier, as Ed Sakota said in the Whipsaw song, one big winner pays for them all. Well, the problem is you got to make sure you get that big winner. So could this fuel turn into the next big winner? I mean, statistically, it might not, okay? But it could. And we don't know going in. That's the thing. All these trades we think have tremendous longer-term potential. So if you look at the open portfolio as of last night, you could see that $4,000 of the $2,000 of gains, round numbers, is what? Is this one stock? So the portfolio would be negative by about, what, uh, 2K? If you took 4K away from that. And then also, this is the fuel trade. Now it's backed off a little bit today. So you'd have to add another $800 to that. So this number would be much uglier. It's about a $4,000 swing, I think. I was kind of rough, roughing it out earlier, right before we went live. But the point is that you'd have a substantial loss here by missing one outlier. So you have to follow the plan. Now, in Jim's defense, he slept in. So it wasn't like he was a deer in the headlights, second-guessing the system, second-guessing himself, trying to outsmart things. He just happened to sleep in, okay? It trust me, it happens. So that's one thing that I can't solve for you because you're personally going to have to know how to deal with these things. You need to put systems in place for you, okay? Um, one thing I was thinking about right as I was going live this morning is last week we talked about accountability, okay? And one way to get accountability is to find someone who believes in the methodology or a similar methodology, okay? So find yourself another trend follower and maybe jaw jack each other a little bit because that, that you know, at least I'm kind of thinking from a guy, testosterone kind of way. But if you jaw jack a little bit, it's kind of like, hey, man, I got this big trade. Why didn't, why didn't you take it? You know, it, it becomes a bit competitive. But make it competitive and then that you're following the rules. And in a case like this, maybe it's like, hey, are you fuels triggering? What are you doing? You know. So that would be one of many ways to hold yourself accountable would be to have a trading partner. Uh, for the brave, for the bravest of the brave, and this is mostly for men, not women, you men get your wives involved, okay? As I've said before, you women, don't let your husbands get involved because it's been proven that your trading will get worse, at least statistically it seems to be the, the general issue. But you husbands who are brave enough, get your wives involved, and then... Tell her, hey, honey, I missed a big trade. It's like, well, why did you get it? It's like, well, I didn't wake up. Well, then guess what? She's going to wake you up <laughs> from now on. 
okay? So the point is, put systems in place and figure out what works for you. Way to solve is to buy a mega box of paper clips. That's a good idea. Too many big words today. All right, sorry about that. All right, any questions on any of this pontification so far? Ron Papil, set and forget it. Yeah, you know, and I often talk about Ron Papil, Showtime Rotisserie 2000 Grill. I think that's the name of it, where it set it and forget it. And trading's a little bit more difficult than that, but a lot of times it's not. And I think I went through the chem example a few weeks back. So go in and watch that week of charts where I was like, okay, well, what do you do? Well, you place an order to enter. Order triggers. What do you do? You place a protective stop. The next day, nothing. Next day, nothing. Next day, nothing. Okay? Then you might bump that stop at some point. Then you might take some profits at some point. But 90% of the time, you're not doing anything. Go back to February 7th. Take a look at the portfolio. I think you can get the archives on the delayed service page. And fast forward to today, look at each one of those trades. And on most days, there was nothing to do. I'm going to bore you to death. I wish trading was more exciting. Somebody once emailed me and said, you're trying to make trading exciting with the market in a minute. Trading is not exciting. It's like, oh, I'm just kind of having fun with the market in a minute. Give me a break, you know, so I... I did, a, I did the next market in a minute. Hello, everyone. It's the market in a minute. <laughs> but I'm just having fun with that, right? I'm not trying to make it exciting. It can be exciting at times. It can be scary at times. But trading done properly, for the most part, is really boring. If you want some excitement, do something else, okay? Don't look to the market for action. As I often joke, have it a fair. That way you only lose half of your money. All right. Hey, guess what? It's happening. My beginner's course has become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's kind of morphed into a, not only the basics, but come back to the basics if you're struggling. I've been paying extra careful attention to the emails I've received over the past several months frame within the context of could a basics course or better said could returning to the basics basics solve the problem and in 99.99 percent of the cases or i think all the cases really yes is the answer so it got me to thinking about trading full circle if you don't know anything about trading what you need to know to become profitable and if you may have lost sight of the basics and if you're chasing rainbows and you're doing a lot of things that you shouldn't be doing, instead of just following along, then the way you become profitable again is to come back to the basics. So I'm going to have to put this count. I'm going to have to just start this countdown. So keep an eye out for that. Um, maybe on maybe tomorrow I'll put the countdown on. And then I've got some updated articles once you uh, sign up to get the uh, – the first set of videos, the first set of videos are free in this, by the way, building the base. It's four videos. And once you sign up for those, I've updated three articles that are uh, one on money management, one on trading psychology, and one on the methodology itself. So once you sign up for that, you'll be brought to a page, a thank you page, and then you'll get those articles. So check that out. And this is part of the learning management system. And everything is, the back end is built. So it's just a matter of me getting this thing rolled out. And again, there's a free multi-part base as part of it. And I'll have more information on that. So just keep an eye on my website. And then I might uh, put in a newsletter tomorrow if I get around to putting on a newsletter. Uh, once again, make sure you're at least on the delayed service. Now, if you've been on the delayed service over a year, as I often joke, it's kind of assy, but <laughs> it's true. Good, good traders make quick decisions. If it takes you a year to decide whether or not my methodology is for you, then maybe you shouldn't be trading. But uh, it, 
I haven't been updating it as much as I would like to, uh, just because of a few things. One, a lot of the positions have gone a long time without triggering. I didn't think about that, but with an IPO specifically or especially, they can go a while without trading it. So I can't put the service on delayed service, the current service on delayed or the one week on delayed as long as there's an open possible trade in it. And, and so that's why there's a delay in that. And then you'll notice I'll catch up for like two weeks and then it'll, you won't see any new for a while. And there is a limited amount of people I can have on this. I get charged for people on that. So um, if you get bumped, don't take it personally. But if you are, if you don't have a lot of money or you just want to learn and, and you've been burnt before by somebody else, which you probably have, then just let me know. Just Dave, can I just follow along for a while longer? And I'll be happy to make an exception. Got any questions, shoot me an email. Those requiring a lot of thought, I'll cover them in the week of charts. Quick answers, I'll shoot it right back to you. And there's a plethora of stuff on my website. And as part of the learning management system, I will make all that stuff easier to find and a lot more uh, better, for lack of a better word. Organized, better. And the lessons will come out in more of a, what's a good word, logical order. And there'll probably be a nominal charge for that, but I think it'll be worth it. All right, let's take a look at the overall market. And then let's, if I still have the indicator in here, it'd be kind of fun to look at that indicator. It would take me too long to put it back in. Um, as I've been saying quite a bit, when... A market is at or near new highs you want to err on the side of the longer term trend so you can see we had that pretty good run since back in November and my mantra up in here was at or near new highs air on the side of longer term trend that we had a pretty good run going into March and then we went back to chopping sideways back and get filling and that's fine with me I remember thinking back in November, I would much rather if this market would go up, consolidate, go up, consolidate, go up, consolidate. Now, in the middle of consolidation, I'm like, damn it, I wish this thing would start going up again, okay? And that's the hard part is the waiting. But when you have these consolidations, a la Darvis style boxes, the market has time to adjust to new levels. So everybody gets used to prices being at a certain level. So 20, uh, let's just say 2200 might have seemed kind of high for the market. But now if the market dropped to 2200 over the next few weeks, boy, that would really seem low. So now 2300, 2400 is becoming the new sort of equilibrium range, so to speak, where supply and demand are equalizing out. So continue to err on the side of longer term trend, but just eyeballing it, okay? New high here, and then what? All these days here, no new closing high, okay? New high here, all these days here, except for one, and then two, no new closing high. Now we had a nice run here, so there were a few days where you made new closing highs, but then you went back to consolidating again. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a little better than the P's, obviously. First of all, big blue arrow, still intact here. And one thing I'm just kind of noticing here, look how obvious that is. Hey, it's just in a long-term uptrend. Just follow along. Well, it's a lot harder to do when you're stuck in a range like this, okay? And then it was a bit of a shakeout move, obviously, going into the election. And in that case, you just audit your stops. You get stopped out, so be it. And then you had another run higher, a little shakeout, higher, consolidation, shakeout, higher, consolidation. So even though it looks like it just went straight up, there was a lot of days where there was serious consolidation. That's one thing I found out early on. It's one thing to program a trading system where it goes flat for weeks and weeks and maybe even months. And then, oh, look, I made 100% based on this trading system. Let me go ahead and trade it. And it's another thing to actually sit there for weeks and weeks and months and months and let things unfold. And again, 
as a fresh, freshman psychology, we're going to talk about, yeah, the patience is really important. Let's take a look at the Rusty finally making new all-time highs. All-time closing highs and uh, all-time highs yesterday, right? Well, what's it doing today? Well, it's back at a villain, okay? Back to the 96% of the time. The original research, I think, was done on the Dow going back to the 1800s, for those who are interested. And it was daily data. But again, air on the side of long-term trend until proven wrong, until stopped out. Now, you do want to start getting selective once you see the market chopping sideways like this, okay? Make sure you have a setup that could go up in spite of the market, okay? Or in lieu of the market going sideways. As you would expect, a lot of areas looking pretty good. Health services break it out nicely to do highs. Could see setups there and pullbacks. Manufacturing, break it out to new highs. Materials and construction, right at new highs. Long-term uptrend attack there. Take a look at like retail, which had been kind of like all over the place. It's now beginning to bang out new highs. Today, notwithstanding. Transports went up to new highs. Coming back in a little bit, but so far, continue to kind of creep along, as you can see, or creep along this trend line. Software, breaking out nicely to new highs. The semiconductors looked a little dubious just about a week ago, and then they're back to new highs in here. This is why I didn't get too excited and rush out and short a bunch of, bunch of semiconductors. Now, all isn't fantastic in the world. I think the banks still look like they're in trouble, even though we had this gap in here recently. Energies are kind of all over the place. They kind of look dubious in here at best. Metals and mining, banging out new lows. Take a look at gold. Uh, just kind of wide and loose and now banging out some new multi-week lows. Let's take a look, look at gold. He tried to say the commodity. Gold, the commodity, looking better than gold, the stocks. But you still got quite a bit of overhead supply to deal with in here. I don't see any reason to rush out and buy any gold at this juncture. And then we're short MS, which is Morgan Stanley. And you can see the brokers not looking so hot in here. So they, they look like they're still in trouble, even with that little bit of a retrace rally. Now, when we get to the charts, somebody will probably, and I don't want to, I probably shouldn't frame the show, but somebody will probably ask me about a short that's that's in, in between, in mid-range. For instance, let's say you got a major, major high and a major, major low, and the stock trades in between these. Okay, somebody will probably ask me about a short somewhere in the mid-range of these two. Uh, especially while the market is at or near new highs, I also want my shorts to be towards the fringe, towards those new highs and beginning to break down. And the reason is, if they break down from these high levels, they have a long way to go down. Okay, and that's why when we're looking at like bow ties in the S&P 500, on like a weekly basis, I often talk about the weekly bow ties, but only from the fringe, okay? From here, that's a legitimate major bow tie. That's a legitimate major bow tie, okay? Short, long, short, long, okay? And then we did have a bow tie, major bow tie here, and it didn't really materialize. If you go back and look at the Russell, it did drop 18%, okay? And it did look like the mother of all tops. But then the market turned around and went right back up. So if you are going to short a market, at least in the early phases of a trend, make sure that transitional pattern is towards the new highs. And that will make more sense possibly when we get to the, the chart. So overall, without going through too many more sectors, sector actually looking pretty good. Bonds are kind of interesting in here, he tried to say. Um, they're kind of bottoming out, at least on a daily chart, somewhat shorter term. Now, it's coming back into the range, but that's fine. I just don't want to see bonds make a route lower like they did back in October, November, because that means what? Rates are higher, and that could put a lot of pressure on the overall market. Uh, dollar not looking so hot. Kind of a bumpy ride, though. But you can see dollar is not looking so great 
in here. It's kind of interesting that commodities are weak, even though the dollar is not so hot. Um, in a market technical analysis, 101 says a weak dollar means what? Strong commodities. And that's because it's going to take more and more dollars to buy those commodities. Okay. All right. Let's jump into the individual stocks. Uh, if you have any questions about individual stocks, start asking those now. Craig says we have computers. What do you mean by that? Quite a bunch today. Adobe, okay. I'm probably not going to like Adobe. Uh, it's better looking than I thought it would be. Um, take a look at like fuel, for instance. HV of 79. That's just a statistical measurement. Um, the formula is pretty long, but don't worry about the formula. Just know that it's a relative type of measurement, a measurement of beta, if you will. So let's take a look at the, the spiders, for instance. HV of 8, okay? So I would prefer my stocks to have a beta higher than the market. You're not going to beat the market with stocks that are less volatile than the market itself. Now, I know some people might argue with me on that, and I'd be happy to have a civilized debate with them. And the quick answer is because something bad can still happen in a less volatile stock, and you're not going to make enough to recoup that something bad, okay? And then I guess the other, the only reason why, in some cases, less volatile stocks might beat the market is because they become more volatile, and that's the only way. And that's just, now you're getting back to playing a, a longer-term volatility cycle, and that's a little bit more advanced than I want to get into today. But getting back to the Adobe, uh, a couple of things here. One, it's a big, thick stock, meaning that it trades a lot of shares. So this is what I got to add two zeros. 24 million shares on average. Okay. The other thing is the HV, again, is really low. S&P is like 8. This is 11. Uh, right now, on the short side, and I'm not shorting much, but I'm finding opportunities in some of these more efficient stocks, in volatility around 20-something percent. What's that market, Stanley? 23%, uh, see? But on the long side, I'm finding opportunities in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. See, look at this, Kim. This is 60, you can see. So HV kind of low in Adobe, historical volatility. That's 50-day historical volatility. I have the, char uh, the formulas for Telechart if you want them. I didn't write this one but I wrote some other ones in here for pullbacks and stuff, and I'll, I just give them away. But you can see it's just kind of low in volatility, so this would actually have to accelerate higher and pull back. I think you'd be better off looking at something like a fuel as opposed to a big fixed stock like this. Now, I kind of like just the opposite on the short side, so that's why we shorted Morgan Stanley because the big efficient stock and efficient stocks can have inefficient moves. Like I alluded to a minute ago, the volatility can increase and that inefficiency com can come in, especially in a transitional type of shorting package. Now, before I back myself into a corner, it takes me a while to get out of, just go in and read the free report, Go, Go, Nomo. It's on my website in the store. If you go to the store and scroll down to the bottom, I make you walk through the gift shop first <laughs> to get to the free stuff. But read that article on that. So I hear you. It's in a nice trend. It's in a nice persistent trend. There's nothing wrong with this stock other than it's real thick and the volatility is low. And something bad can still happen. So I would encourage you to go after the, um, the fuels of the world and stuff that's in this portfolio right here on the long side, at least. All right. Uh, plug is back. Let's take a look at that. You're welcome. Lewis. Long-winded answer, but I, but um, I'm guessing you're a newer Lewis. There, we we had a Lewis in here before. I don't know if you're a new Lewis or an older Lewis, or, or you used to, or, or somebody who's been coming through the webinar. So I wanted to make sure I flesh that out. Um, HV. Now, see, I just talked about HV, but when you get 
it's in the triple digits, that's a little bit on the extreme side, okay? Here's the other problem, too. You had like a 100% gap. Let me just see what that is. If I could find it. Yeah, round numbers. You had almost a 100% gap overnight. Um, that creates a disequilibrium in markets. There's another one of those big words I'm trying to say today. And stocks tend to chop around after that happens, and it's just uh, a little too crazy. But I, I hear you. Uh, yeah, it's it's trying to make a comeback in here, but it's just it's actually too crazy, even by Big Dave standards. Okay. We could set up our trades automatically. Um. Yeah, that contingency orders could be a can of worms. And uh, I've tried to help a few clients before, and it just becomes a mess uh, because they'll be like, okay, just put this in. And they're like, I don't have that on my account. It's like, well, don't you have an account with this brokerage? And they're like, yeah. It's like, well, I'm not seeing it. It's like, well, it should be there, and it's not there. Come to find out they're at their account's at another level or something, you know. So it can become a real mess. So you're on your own on contingency orders, but sometimes a contingency order – can keep you out of a lot of trouble and can help to automate your trading. Don't go crazy with this automation of your trading because in reality, it only takes a few minutes a day. You know, wake up um, and then put your orders in a few minutes after the open or on the open. It depends on whatever the situation is. If a stock opens below your entry, then put your entry in and, and go about your life. Go save some lives, train some dogs. Or if you're retired, go relax. Don't sit here and watch a screen all day. As one client says, I'm going to go do something far more interesting. Amen. Um, but where a contingency order can help you is, let's say you have a stop order in place. The stock must be trading below the stop order. And the bid, I'm sorry, the ask must also be uh, below the stop order and that means that that stock has significantly traded through that stop or has positively traded through that stop and proper action should be taken in other words you should exit the stock so you're on your own on those but um, look into them if it's uh, if it's a tool that could help you okay disequilibrium you mean there is a distance Disturbance of the force? <laughs> oh, geez. G. Dave, if you're trading up money, you might want to know how to use a platform. Yeah, I mean, you talk about, I know how to use my platform, but yeah, learn how, make sure you know how to use your platform, okay? And there's too many platforms and too many variations out there for me to help. But what I would encourage you to do is just write an algorithm first and figure out how you're going to get that algorithm into your platform. And if you have to, Pay somebody a hundred bucks to do it for you, you know. But just say, okay, like I just said, uh, for my stop to get executed, the market has to be trading below my stop, and the ask has to be below my stop, okay. And that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And the reason I, I keep using that as like an example is that I had a client once stayed with a stock that we shorted. And he wrote it out for years or, or at least months. I forget how long he wrote it out. And what happened was there were one or two trades above the stop. And I think it was a maximum of 200 shares. I don't remember if it was two 100 share trades or one 100 share trades, but I think it was Havanarian. Or Did I say that wrong? I always say that wrong. Let me see if I can try to say that. Anyway, the point is Havanarian. Havanarian. I can't say it. Hav nan an. Hav nan nan nan. It's kind of <laughs> I, at one point I would actually Google how to say it. <laughs> Anyways, H O V. And what he did was again, he had in a contingency order that said, hey, it's got to trade above my stop because he was short. And it has to also be bidding above my stock. And that those two simple little rules kept him from being stopped out on a spike alone. Now, again, it's a slippery slope when you try to automate your trades too much, but if a little automation will keep you out of trouble, then by all means, knock yourself out, okay? A-L-S-K. A-L-S-K for Mr. Andre. 
Um, it's a little wide and loose, but I hear you. It's it's shot higher. Thin. This is an Andre type of stock. Um, on a pullback, possibly, but the HV doesn't fully reflect how crazy this one is. Plus, it's really thin, so be careful on that. I know that's your stick, so that's fine. You know what you're doing. I'm not sure that you want the average person, or let's just say a newbie, rushing in and doing that. S, Q, and S. Yeah, it's a little bit on the thin side, but not incredibly bad. A couple of thousand share. A little kind of wide and loose and choppy. Um, I like to see more acceleration higher than maybe a pullback. You got most of the moves is one big wide range bar higher. I like wide range bars higher, don't get me wrong, but I like some sort of structure afterwards. Galt. That's going to be a shipper, right? Or am I confusing it with something? Nope. That's a, uh, yeah, again, this is that wide range par problem. It just kind of shot higher. And percentage-wise, what's that move? That's pretty big move over a couple days. Uh, what's that, 50%, 40%? So it's just too crazy. And look at the HV, 141. Um, I would leave that one alone. Okay, John, yeah, we went over that one already, BLDP, I think, or did we? Um, I like that this one's breaking out now. Um, you know, I was telling somebody a few days ago that maybe I'm too much of a perfectionist now. Like this, I didn't, I didn't like this pullback. I didn't think it was deep enough, but now that it's breaking out, uh, I would definitely keep it on my watch list. It does have some bad memories back here, but that's a long ways away. So yeah, I'm going to pull back on that one. Can we get the recording? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I record these and then. I post them to YouTube. It takes about three or four hours to process them, or at least for me to get around to processing them. And uh, they also go to my website. And one thing I just updated on my website, I was telling you about how disorganized it is. But there is one part of my website that is pretty organized that it's kind of hidden away that you might not even know about, and that's the video section. So let me just pop that up real quick, and then we'll get to those... Uh, Wix, good example of what I was talking about, Greg. Uh, we'll pop that up next. Yeah, Greg gave me a good example. Now, Wix was in my Landry list. Let's take a look at that while I'm waiting on the website to come up. Um, and I kind of picked it apart. I didn't like the fact that this one pulled back to this prior little peak in here, and then it took off, of course, from that. But this was in my Landry list going back. What day was this? But that's a good example of me looking for 418. Let's see if we got 418 in here. Uh, would be for 419. See, look, Wix right there, okay? And if you back the chart out a little bit, I liked it, but it's like I didn't like the fact that it pulled back to this prior little base. But it certainly wasn't a horrible setup, okay? It was good enough for me to like, okay? I gave it a like by putting it in my lander list. But I didn't take it. So to answer your question, no, I didn't take it. And, uh, and that... Uh, could you please do a case study, throw in HV? Could we do a case study of PLSE? Oh, okay, PLSE, 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 okay. Uh, before we get into that, let me just show you right here. If you go into videos, and I cleaned this up a few days ago, that's why I'm showing it to you now. But if you're looking for a lot of this information, a lot of the things that I talk about in the week of charts are kind of like built upon prior webinars. So you've got them all here. Uh, like today, we talked about trend following was hard. What would it look like if it was easy? And then today's will be, maybe it's hard, you know? <laughs> and then I kind of I became a little bit obsessed with Bill Ackman for a while just because I'm not sure how he lost those billions and billions of dollars. And that, that brought me back to thinking of maybe uh, coming back to the basics uh, is what you need. Anyway, so that's in the videos right here on the website. And then there's a plethora more of these, too. And then the free reports, which talk about the GoGo Nomo strategy, if you just go to store or shop now, I should say, and scroll down to the bottom, and those free reports are there. And then, like I said right here, and like I said earlier, uh, I've got three articles that I cleaned up, and they're pretty good if I say so myself, fairly long articles on the methodology, psychology, 
and what's the other thing? Money management. And those will be on my home page soon. So look for that coming soon thing. Okay, PLSC. So getting back to Wix, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, uh, I did not take the Wix trade, but it, it was on my radar. But, I, I, you know, maybe I'm a little bit too much of a perfectionist. Now, keep in mind that if we get into a rip-roaring uptrend and the market continues higher, then I might back off a little bit and take some of these setups that, that aren't perfect, okay, but I think are worth a shot. So I will become a little bit more lenient. So Andre wants me to look at Pulse with the HV. Um, you know, this pullback here didn't really look deep enough to me, but I hear you. I mean, it, it, see, that's another case of uh, perfection maybe keeping me out of a trade because it had such an incredible run from 6 up to 15. This is kind of dangerous to get in right here because what could happen is anybody who caught that 500% or whatever, well, I guess in this case, two or 300% run higher, might be looking to bail at break even if this market begins to drop. So I would much rather have let this thing drop significantly a deeper pullback before getting in. So, I mean, if you if you wrote it out, congratulations. But when you get in something like that, you have to realize that it's kind of dangerous. Notice that, see this 300% run here? Oh, let's just figure out what that is. So that's a 300 and whatever, 30-something percent run, 340 round number, round number. So it ran up 340, 350%. And then if you were to try to get in on this one little pullback here, notice that it imploded over coming days. So you're much better off waiting for that deal, deep pullback, okay? Okay, Greg, when eight or nine days ago? W-Y-N-N. No, you see, this is another case where this didn't pull back enough, okay? Now, again, I'm looking for perfection, but this just didn't pull back enough for me. And the HV is a little bit on the low side. Okay, and then it's kind of choppy and sideways. Now, personalities can change with a stock, but I wouldn't necessarily go on after this. Now, I, I like your I like your line of reasoning, though. Go in and look at any stock that takes off and ask yourself, should I have gotten into that trade? And here's the tough part, okay? I can look back at this one with 100% hindsight and say, no, I would not have taken this trade because... I don't think the pullback was deep enough. The same thing goes for that that uh, crazy Andre stock we just talked about, okay? Gelled. That's one I've been watching. Gelled's kind of interesting. Uh, I'd like to see, obviously, a pullback in here. But, yeah, it's sort of interesting. I think it's worth uh, putting on your watch list. looks kind of interesting in here. Right, wind didn't pull back enough, but Wix too much. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And the reason Wix pulled back too much is because it came back into this prior base. Okay, that's the only thing I didn't like about it is that it came back to this prior base. How do you find enough and in or begin a trend? What criteria you look for? Okay, well, you know that's one of those. Um, it depends type of answers. Uh, if you're trading a transitional pattern, there's not you don't need much pullback. Okay, so let's take a look at Twilio. Okay. And we had a bow tie here. Okay. So we're coming off of these all time lows. So notice that we we got long on not much of a pullback. Okay. That's a transitional pattern. Now I just got through wrapping up the the introduction of transitions, because transitions are, are, are fairly involved, but I just got through wrapping up the introduction to transitions section of this course that I've been working on for the last two years. And as I said in the beginnings, like, look, the reason I'm calling it introduction is because I get more questions on my transitional setups than all of my other setups combined. So it's a little bit more tricky to trade these transitions as opposed to pullbacks in existing trends. But just to answer your question, if it isn't a transition, then you have to be willing to get long at the first signs of a pullback. It could be the tiniest of tiny, tiny pullbacks, usually a lower low and a lower high, sometimes just a lower high. So a very tiny pullback, a one-bar pullback is always necessary. Now, if you're looking at a stock that's in more of an established uptrend, 
like this fuel, for instance, notice that the pullback here, and let me just give you a rough measurement, at least on a closing basis, is a 20% pullback. Now, I can't give you an exact number, but if you eyeball it, and let's let's do this for S and G's. Let's take the let's take the the chart out, and see if that helps us to see it. It's got to pop up somewhere. Where's this pop up going? I can't find it. Hang on one second. Talk among yourselves. Amongst yourselves. All right. Let's make it black. Okay. So to me, that looks like a a decent pullback. Notice that it ran from like two-ish up to like five-ish, okay, and then corrected all the way back down to four. So you have to ask yourself, what's a pullback, okay? A pullback means that people got shaken out of the market, okay, because when a market begins to sell off, people will sell the stock. Sometimes that selling can beget more selling. Somebody got in earlier and they see all these profits and they see the profits begin to erode. Well, psychologically, there's some pressure on them to get out of the market. Somebody who got in late to the game, like right up here, market begins to sell off, like, oh, crap, here we go again. They're going to be pressured as it goes further and further down to sell. Now, you don't know if the selling has exhausted itself, but if you have a deep pullback and a sharp uptrend, then you know that maybe, just maybe, if it turns back up, that selling has already exhausted itself and those buyers are out of the way, along the lines of the trend um, knockout pattern. Moving averages or 10-day simple, 20-day exponential, and 30-day exponential. Go back to the store, and then uh, when you go here, I need to fancy this up a little bit, uh, download the moving average uh, report on transitions. It should be in here somewhere. Get this one right here and that'll tell you how to do that. Let's see. Uh, right here. Trading emerging trends of the bow tie pattern. Okay. And uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to be a beta tester, I don't know. I see you have a friend in here. I don't know what your name is, but uh, friend, uh, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll get you on the uh, uh, beta test list for the course and you'll, you'll get a lot of this information. And it'll answer a lot of questions, okay? Uh, shot for Greg. But just to finish this, uh, just real quick, to finish this up, so fairly deep pullback in a case like this. Um, the wicks had pulled back to a prior base. And then that prior stock we were talking about, it just didn't pull back enough to correct the prior trend. CLBR? Never heard of it. You have the right symbol? I'll go ahead and delete that out. Uh, CLBR uh, for Susie. Uh, you have another symbol for me? Or is it, it's, it's not a uh, penny stock, is it? Salt over eight. Um, okay. This was one that we were long and possibly still long based with a little discretion. And as far as a new setup, here's a case where a stock pulled back below its base. So I would say no. If you're still in trend follow, I think I might have a small position still here. If you're still in trend following mode, then stay with it, but not as a new position because, again, it pulled all the way back to this prior base. So if you have a stock that makes a base and then it goes, then it rallies out of the base, it's hard to draw like this, but and then it comes back into the base, then it's no longer a pullback, okay? No problem, CLRB, CLRB. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, okay. First thing that kind of strikes me here is this stock has gone down for how long? Uh, since, okay, that's six weeks of downward movement. Is my math right on that? Yeah, six weeks. It's, so it's going down for six weeks. So that's the first thing that would I would immediately toss this one out. A lot of people can't believe I can go through a couple thousand stocks in, I don't know, 20 minutes maybe. Maybe not even 20 minutes. depends on the market conditions. But the reason I could do that is because when I'm flipping through charts and I see that, oh, I can't get to it. And I see that, it's like, okay, well, that's just going down lately. So let's leave that alone. 
So if anything, it looks like it's going to go down to hit its old lows. Now, here's the thing. I wouldn't put it on my watch list because it'll come up when it sets up again. But if this stock goes down and makes if this stock goes down and makes all time lows and bottoms out and then makes a bow tie or something, then it might be worth a shot. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about crossing the moving averages or MACD or DMI? Okay, I don't use DMI. In my first book, I inadvertently put too much information, put too much um, uh, accidentally emphasized ADX too much, but I no longer use ADX. And back then, I was just using it to help me find trending stocks. I don't use it anymore. I don't use MACDs either, okay? Uh, moving averages, there's just a few things I'm looking for. I'm looking for... I'm looking for the slope of the moving average. I'm looking for daylight, and I'm looking for the order. So let's say we're looking at the S&P 500. Might work better on a weekly. Notice we have positive slope. Okay. Notice we have daylight. The lows are greater than the moving average for the most part. And notice that the order is 10 is greater than 20, greater than 30. So just the order of these and the slope of these. For instance, here, 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 not here, here, okay, as I, I showed earlier, and here can help to keep you on the right side of the market, okay? So get on as a beta tester, and, and you'll see a lot of this stuff in the course. I, mean, I cover all of this stuff. Friend wants to know about UAA, Under Armour, okay. Well, if you want to buy this stock, it's obviously headed in the wrong direction longer term, right? Okay, draw your big blue arrow. So that's in a downtrend. Now, if you zoom in, I hear you. It's popping up today. Well, the problem with buying this stock now is that anyone who owned it back here and suffered through this gap is going to seriously think about bailing out on top of you. So I would not trade that stock. Or you're looking at stochastics. What's a stochastic? I don't know what that is. A stochastic? That's, I've never heard of that. Stochastic. That's strange. Stochastic. Okay. Toco on a new closing high. Uh, yes. Yes. A little thin, though. Super thin, but yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, that would be the buy a B pattern. Let's put in the uh, Dave Landry's, uh, what are we going to call it? I need to put my name on it. My wife is bitching at me. Got to put my name on the next pattern. Take a book, take a page out of John Bollinger's book. So if you were trading the Dave Landry's five-day moving average IPO greatest setup in the world setup, then you would wait for a new closing high and then the low to also have to be above this five-day moving average. So absolutely, that looks good. That's on my list, but thin, 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 thin. I'm a new one. Okay, new Lewis, welcome aboard, okay? Now, some of you, like I had one guy who's like, finally quit coming to the, to the uh, shows. He's like, you hate everything I pick. It's like, well, start picking better stocks. <laughs> it's like, you know, he's, he's asking about all these stocks that are going straight down. And I'm a trend follower. It's like, no, you get, no, Nicholas Fine, as Nicholas Fine would say, no. I wonder where Nicholas is. I haven't found him in a while. Let's see if I can find him. Mule for Brad. I changed computers a while back. It's hard to find. No, nope, can't find him. Nicholas Fine. Uh, Google him. I watch a uh, YouTube on him. You're welcome, Lewis. Glad to have you, man. Mule for Brad. Look at that mule. Uh, no, so far no. Ed, guess what I said? Remember? What I, guess what I said? Remember what I said earlier about the the high being set of first day of trading? So look at that. Your all time high was set on the first day of trading. So this would have to close above this high for me to get excited about it. So yeah, if it's in your IPO list, keep it in your IPO list. But until it gets above this high or bottoms out for the next six months and then begins to rally, it wouldn't be uh, on the list. My Marcy Landry breakout move. <laughs> Maybe I'll put Marcy's name on it. UCTT. Yeah, that's a, that's a good looking stock. If I can get it to come up. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. 
Yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. But again, you know, here's the thing. You can't kiss all the women, so you can't always say that your pattern would have gotten you into the trade. Although I know somebody got in back here on this TKO type of move, which was pretty cool. PayPal? Probably not going to like it. Um, it's breaking out today. I hear you. But it's another case of one of these big, thick stocks, okay? It just kind of chops around. As you can see, it's wide and loose, okay? Now, yes, it's breaking out today, but there was no structure to it that would have signified that breakout. So I would avoid it. I mean, look how thick that is. Just way too thick. Next. Yeah, there you go. There's your new closing high. See, your new high was set, but it, it, but the range is pretty slim on this one, okay? So I would let it establish itself a little bit more. It only came public with like a less than one point range, so I wouldn't necessarily buy this new high in this particular one. I would take more of a secondary pattern. Just wait to see if it can rally for a little bit and then play pullbacks along the way. But, yeah, put it on your watch list for sure. For sure. Brett wants to know about shop. That's been a pretty good run. Now, here's a case where you guys were asking about depth of pullback and such. Notice that it pulled back into its prior little top here, okay? So I would toss that one out based on that rule, but I hear you. It's in a longer-term trend. It's pulled back a little bit. It certainly looks okay. You could certainly do a lot worse. But based on, on, on the way I look at things, and I like to look for perfection, I would toss it out because it's pulled back in below this prior little breakout bar. But I hear you. Uh, Brad, I can't talk about that one. It's on my lander list for today. But, yeah, it looks good. I like it. Good job. And whoever got fuel last week or week before, good job on that one, too. That's uh, We got long that one yesterday. Okay, T-A. Yeah, another one of these IPOs, new highs, um, the range issue I talked about earlier. Now, there's a lot of simple, simple things when it comes to trading IPOs, like just buy them when they make new closing highs with a few caveats. Well, some of those caveats is that if an IPO comes public, you want some kind of excitement to it. This is only a two-point-ish, two-and-a-half-point range on a 20-something dollar IPO. And I also have some rules about buying new highs and IPOs that are above $20. And not enough time to get into that today. Uh, but based on that rule and based on the fact that it's only moved a couple of points uh, and since it's been public and there's not a whole lot of range to it, I would pass on that one. But, yeah, put it on your watch list. And if it does this, if it keeps making new highs, then on pullbacks, absolutely. But, I mean, you know, you're in the hunt, at least, on buying an IPO that's making new highs as opposed to one that's making new lows, absolutely. WTTR, that's Howard. Well, Howard, how would you need to join the service? Now, this one has a little bit more range. Notice because it's a $14 stock. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, this one could set up soon on the long side. Put in that Marcy Landry um, five-day super-duper IPO breakout pattern. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, Brett. Keep that on your radar. Looks like it's got a good volume, too. That's a good-looking stock. Less volatility can outperform a down market. Uh, yeah, until the extent, until the volatility expands. I mean, I like, like I said, like Morgan Stanley because um, it's lower in volatility. It's, it's kind of like price for perfection at these high levels. It begins to crack it'll begin to crack hard, but so far we're losing money on this trade, so might not be the best example. Would you have bought an IPO like Sam that made a new high on day two? No. Well, forget, it depends on what your question is. Um, oh, you're going to want to go way back there? Well, let's pick it apart in hindsight. Um... Good Lord, he had a long memory. No, you see what saying, new high on day two? No, because, because it went down, okay? But let's let's throw a bow tie in there, and that might give you a good example. I mean, in perfect hindsight, obviously. 
So what did I say earlier? It's like, well, you don't want to buy them to, if you don't want to buy them to make a new high period, okay? Closing high or all-time high, whatever the case may be, based on the one-day rule. But as I say often, the wait five-day rule will keep you out of a lot of trouble. So here you go, one, two, three, four, five, then the stock implodes. Now, you have a bow tie over here. It might be worth a shot as a transitional pattern on that first little bow tie. And lo and behold, look, it worked. Well, it worked for a while. We'll stop you out of the profit. But better than the poke now. You get the idea, okay? So, yeah, uh, day two is okay for a new high. But make sure that you're taking out that that new thing. Sam is beer quality. Yeah, Sam's okay. I make my own beer. Well, I'm actually low carbon for now. I could have beer on Saturdays. I get a cheat day. But Sam's okay. I mean, it's not bad. I mean, I could drink it in a pinch. If all I could drink was Sam during the week, I'd, I'd drink it. <laughs> but I can't drink beer during the week now. Womp womp. I know, people are dying in the world. Yeah, I mean, this one already broke out. Um, and then there was really no discernible pattern that would have got you in because back here it looked like it was in trouble when it gapped down. You know, put it in your uh, put in your list. Snap, we covered Snap early in the show, uh, Brad. It's not a buy yet. CPRX. That's, how, that's the one we've been looking at uh, each week. Uh, if you're already long, stay long, but it's now too many days in the pullback. It's, you know, it's a little wide and loose, too, but I hear you. We'll be LDP along on Tuesday, 284, so it'll have the day, race stop. BLDP along on Tuesday at 284, so it half at 308, race stop to break even and trailing it from there. Landry method working great. You're welcome, Dom. TGS for Mr. Brett. Time for a few more. Yeah, this looks pretty good. And this is a case of, okay, maybe I'm looking for perfection, but I'd like to see a little bit more pullback here, okay? Because it's had such a great run over a long period of time. So just a little bit more pullback. But, you know, I can almost give you a high five on this one, you know, because it looks good. I think it's in my list for today. Well, I can't look uh, now, but it's in my list or... It's a little bit on the thin side, though. That's the only thing. Not too bad. But, yeah, I'd like to see a little bit deeper pullback, and maybe that's me looking for perfection, maybe down to 14. But you could certainly do much worse. I mean, that's what a good setup looks like. You know, nice, obvious trend followed by a pullback. But based on the magnitude of that trend, I would like to see a little bit more pullback. RCM. Yeah, that I've been watching on, on that LL. Yeah, I mean, I hear you. Maybe on a pullback, but you've got all this bad memories back here and a big gap, so I would leave that alone. Yeah, lumber li liquidators, easy for me to say. Uh, it's kind of coming back from the dead. Any of you guys watch Billions? Uh, they, would, they, would, they actually use lumber liquidators as a, as a verb, I guess. Yeah. They were shorting some Chinese stock, and they said, hey, it's going to go lumber liquidators on you. Um, just a lot of bad memories back here. It's just got too many bad memories, but I hear you. I saw this breakout. I saw this pullback. Um, it looks okay, but just too many bad memories. Yeah, Howard, I'm, I'm long that one. I just I prefer not to talk about it, but, yeah, I'm long that one. I'm actually long that. B1. Uh, on a pullback, absolutely. Let me take a look at that other one, see what it's doing today. Maybe I could talk about it. I hear you though. If I can find it. Uh, I'd rather not. That's going to get people into trouble. It's just too crazy. Yeah, Con. I, I saw that one yesterday. Con is a is a retail stock that's uh, making new highs. So, yeah, maybe on pullbacks. It's got a lot of bad memories along the way, but I'd say put it on your watch list. I have it on my watch list. So, I mean, you're in the hunt. I don't know if I'll take it or not. I have to, I'll, I'll take it when I know it. All right, we're going to have to wrap things up. Time for one or two more. Um, 
No, there's nothing going on here. This is uh, Brad. You asked about that. Yeah, you know, just draw your lines, okay? It's just chopping sideways in here. Uh, for me to get excited, it would probably have to go down to make new lows, and then you'd have all this overhead supply. Or better yet, maybe just break out the new highs and pull back. So. TGS for Brett. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Yeah, I agree. A uh, little deep pullback would be nice. CVGI. Okay, we're going to have to go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, yeah, maybe on a pullback, but if you back the chart way out, it does have yeah, a little bit of bad memories, but not too bad. So, yeah, on a pullback, I'd say quite possibly it could, uh, could certainly set out. I mean, you certainly got the trend higher. All right, I need to go ahead and wrap things up uh, due to the length of the recording and such. Uh, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you being here. You're welcome, Howard. You're welcome, Cliff. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Lander.com. You're welcome, Joe. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, and then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.